also a mute button. So you can just uh, click on those and you can mute and unmute yourself as well as uh, take yourself off, uh, off the screen. So only your name will appear. So if you don't wanna be recorded, please do that. So, uh, so what we'll do is we'll jump into the agenda and sit unless somebody has something really inspiring they wanna share, anything inspiring? There must be something out there. I have something inspiring. You want to hear it? Sure. We had volunteers at the refuge this week. Isn't that amazing? Yes. First time since we closed for COVID. So the visitor center is still closed, but we actually had volunteers out last Wednesday. I think we had three volunteers and we planted, I don't know how many plants, but they put a whole bunch of uh, plants around the uh, Overlook Trail. So it was a lot of fun to see our volunteers. So that's my good news to, to begin with. So I'll put mm. the agenda up, hopefully, bear with me while I share my screen. Um, the host needs to disable participant screen sharing. You know what that means, Mark? Bear with us with our technology challenge. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Is that better now? Uh, let me see. I'll try. Yes, perfect. Thank you. All right. Can everybody see my screen? This is impressive. Whoa. We're not there totally yet. So now I got to figure out how to get rid of this. Stop show from the beginning. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, so thank you again, as I mentioned, for joining us today. We really appreciate your continued support throughout this long, enduring craziness, but uh, we're getting through it together. So today we are, we're we're gonna begin, we began at 6.30 and we would promptly like to uh, be uh, conscientious of your time. So we'll go for about an hour until about 730. However, if anybody needs to stay on and has questions, we can do that. I will hang around, of course. And this is just a little bit of housekeeping on uh, using Zoom. So if you would, please keep yourself muted when not speaking or not talking. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you, if you would like to share. That just helps with background noise. And as you entered the session, uh, I'm even looking, okay. so if you see that microphone icon on the bottom, you could just click on it and there'll be a diagonal line through it, meaning that you're muted and you can unmute yourself if you like to speak. As mentioned earlier, video is optional. So if you don't wanna be recorded or you just wanna show your name, that's just fine. If you wanna uh, ask questions, you can type them right into the chat and uh, Joan is gonna monitor the chat. So please share suggestions, comments, ideas, questions. And we are recording this session. So what's going to happen today is introduction. So if you would kindly put your name in your volunteer position in the chat so that we can get to know everybody and who's attending, or if you want to share anything, that would be awesome. And the refuge staff are going to share some updates, followed by the friends board members will share some updates. And then I'm going to do a presentation on invasive plants and management at the refuge. And then we're going to spend the last 15 minutes or so having uh, just an open discussion, questions, and just enjoying the time with each other. And then we'll do a wrap up. Does anybody have any questions on that? All right. So what we'll do, I'll go ahead and start off the refuge updates. The two staff today that are participating are Patrick Bryant, who's uh, the park ranger that I'm lucky to work with in visitor services and myself. I'm, if you haven't met me, I'm Nancy Corona. I'm the visitor services manager at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. Lucky for me. So some updates, I'm gonna grab my notes. So some of the updates, um, so the visitor center is still closed and we do not have a reopening date. Our, our agency is being very, very cautious, which I'm glad for. Uh, so we don't have any updates on when we'll be reopening, but being very cautious, which is a, is a plus for us, but it also is, I know it's a very difficult because volunteers can come in and the visitors, visitors, serve, visitors are not being able to, to come into the visitor center. So there's a lot of downs to it, but uh, hopefully sooner than later will be reopened. 
The staff has been coming into the office, but we're at a 25% capacity. That means out of the 12 staff, only four staff can be in the visitor center at, or in the office space at one time to reduce the COVID risks. And so that's kind of the basic overview of the management part of the uh, update. Going on to biology, some really, really good news. Has anybody heard how many bison calves have been born? If you did, put it in the chat. Joan, if you would let me know if anybody has the, the number. Anybody know? Um, one, one reply so far. And what's the reply? Um, nine from Amanda. Yes. Nice. Yep. We actually have nine bison calves. And I went through the bison enclosure yesterday and there were several just lounging and sprawled out on the prairie, just relaxing, which I felt like joining them. So, and I think Joan got some really nice pictures of that as well. And this year was interesting because everybody was waiting on them because usually we start having the first calves in April. So it was a little late this year, but it, they all seemed to, to come the first two weeks of May. Usually we get around 12 or so bison calves each year, and we've had at least one the last couple of years in the fall that was uh, born. So things can vary uh, from year to year, but so far so good with nine bison calves. And the elk calves are very difficult to see because the parent, the uh, mother will hide them. So we usually don't see them until later in the season. So we don't know if there's any elk calves at this point. So let's see what else. Lucky for us, we have uh, the return of our biological technician, Kelly Jacobs, and she's been working with uh, Karen, our, our biologist for a number of years as a seasonal, and she's really awesome and it's a big help. So we're really glad she's back. And there will be actually two biolog biology uh, interns hired this year. We usually, I think Karen, uh, our biologist hires about five, but with the COVID restrictions, it's more difficult. So she's hiring two. And as I mentioned earlier, we, the, the biology uh, folks had some overwintering plant plugs that they put outside and put them in hay outside by the greenhouse. So there's several hundred plants that were overwintered. Unfortunately, some of the voles got into it and started eating them, and even the cone containers that they were in. So, but we still have plenty of plants. And as I mentioned last Wednesday, we had three volunteers and some staff plant several uh, hundred plants. So that was a wonderful time. And next, when, uh, next Thursday, May 20th at nine o'clock, I'll be putting out an email. We're also gonna have another planting. So if you'd like to join us, we'd love to see you. Karen also put in a request for a grant to get some, acquire some money so that we can purchase some more additional bird collision, window collision deterrents that I don't know if you've seen on the refuge's windows, but there are a series of dots that allow people to look through the windows, but also protect birds uh, from seeing the reflection of the prairie and the clouds and so that they don't collide with the windows. So we're looking to do more windows to reduce that collision aspect as well as educate people about this topic because uh, I think that the stat is like a billion birds die from window collisions a year and that's just staggering number. So we're trying to educate as well as do our part to protect our birds, which are dear to my heart. And visitor services update, we've been trying our, our task at doing uh, Facebook Live events. And so we did two. So if you'd like to see those, they're on our Facebook page, they're recorded so you can watch them. So we did one on spring ephemeral wildflowers in the Oak Savannah. And then yesterday we did one to highlight World Migratory Bird Day and the bird collision deterrent uh, project that we did. So check those out if you'd like. They're about 20 minutes or so each. This month uh, is we're highlighting the World Migratory Bird Day. It's through the Environment for the Americas, which is a nonprofit organization that is concerned with bird conservation and migratory birds and highlighting and celebrating what they're doing. And so we are doing our part by, we uh, created a self-guided building your bird watching skills uh, trail on the Overlook Trail. So there's a series of six signs with how to to bird watch, uh, there'll be tips on those signs and some photos. So if you want, you can take a walk on the Overlook Trail. It's a half a mile 
and it's a loop, it's, it's a wheelchair accessible, and then you'll find the six signs and with the bird tip ID uh, information. Additionally, there's a brochure you can pick up on the first sign and also at the brochure rack by the flagpole by the visitor center. And uh, I'm also gonna create an on sell tour for that uh, program. So uh, that'll be available on Saturday. And the on sell is an app that you can download and it's a, it'll be a narrated tour and it'll have photos of some of the birds you can see and some information about that. So if you'd like, get out and take a walk, learn a little bit about bird watching and then that on sell tour for that uh, accompanying those uh, signs will be available on Saturday. And some of the projects that I'm working on, my next big project is replacing some of the brown signs that are along the refuge. And that will include giving directional signs to the Oak Savannah Trail, replacing some of the damaged signs. And we're also gonna rename the auto tour, probably something like tall grass wildlife drive or, or prairie wildlife drive, just to give it a more fun name rather than just auto tour. So. And uh, I've been busy with doing some virtual presentations as well, which uh, has been a learning curve as well as it's been a lot of fun. So, so those are the updates. And Patrick, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, if you haven't seen our Facebook Live videos, watch them. I really, really like Nancy's spring wildflower one. That one was excellent in particular. Uh, obviously, we're not doing a whole lot with environmental education right now. Most teachers are hoping to just make it to the end of the year by this point. So normally we'd be doing all oh, three plus field trips a, a week uh, with our partner schools. Obviously that's not happening because the visitor center is still closed, but we're hoping on a fall reopening date. So hopefully early next year, we'll be able to get some school groups out. But we are fortunate to have a teacher extern joining us next month uh, by the name of Aaron Spears, or Aaron Sears, excuse me, who is a teacher at Willowbrook Elementary in Altoona. Um, and she is familiar with the refuge. I actually used to live down the street from Willowbrook and they have a prairie outside of their classrooms. So I've helped them with their prairie before and really excited to have Aaron on and have her help us uh, give us some information about how we can do our curriculum better and then a few other projects. So looking forward to having her on in June. Outreach, again, we're mostly doing the virtual stuff, the Facebook Live, uh, Facebook, other videos as well. So like Nancy mentioned, if you have any topics you're interested in, please let us know. And I actually dropped our uh, on sell link into the chat. So if you haven't seen our on sell tour yet, this is how we redid the auto tour that was on the CDs that you could check out from the visitor center. Um, it is fully narrated now. We are going to expand it to include some other trails and some other activities as well. But feel free if you're ever at the refuge and you haven't seen this yet to give it a listen. Um, I'm partial to the narrator. It's really <laughs> The narrator does good work. He does good work. Uh, other projects we're working on. So I know Jim's a hunter. Uh, he's familiar with our hunt brochure. So if you've ever driven around the refuge during the hunting season, you've probably seen these little brochure holders at all the parking lots that have orange pamphlets in them. Those are information about our hunt regulations for any hunters. We're trying to standardize those as service wide. So we are making a new format for those. So that's gonna be a big project I'm gonna be working on. And I think actually they're gonna look really pretty. They won't be blaze orange, but they should still have lots of good information on them. Other than that, we're just enjoying the spring as much as we can. It's great to be able to get out and do some planting. I was part of the team that worked on and we did five flats that day, Nancy, 500 plants. So it felt oh, wow. really good to be able to see <laughs> volunteers again. It's great getting to see you all on these Zoom calls and it's great to get to see people in person. So, and that's about it for me. Unless, can you think of anything else, Nancy? I don't think so, except for I wanna give a big shout out to Patrick for all his work on technology and getting the videos up and running. It was a big learning curve and he's enabled us to do a lot of outreach through this difficult time. So big shout out to you, Patrick. Thanks for all your support and help. 
Thanks, Nancy. You've taken to it nicely. I think your Facebook Live <laughs> videos are great. We um, the one thing we have to contend with is the wind and the the uh, weather conditions. So that's that's something that can put a, some difficulty in it. But it's been it's been fun. It's been a challenge, but fun. Anybody have any questions about updates uh, about the updates or um, comments or anything? If you come up with anything now, or you can, during the question and answers later on, you're welcome to do that as well. Any information coming in, Joan, in the chat? Um, no, not yet. Okay. So I am going to uh, turn it over to the friends, and they're going to provide us with their update. Yeah, yeah. and I'll, I'll start. And I know we have some other marks on the other board members, Mark Lyle, Jim Johnson, and Sharon Tinker on the call. So if any of them want to jump in. Um, don't really have too many updates since the visitor center is closed, of course, and we ha don't really have any, you know, too many projects or anything. Jim's always busy writing grants, so that never ends. Um, the only thing, um, if any of you know any photographers or if it, or you do come out to the refuge to take photographs, um, we do have the photo contests that will be going on all year. Um, I think the deadline is like October 1st to submit your photos and it'll be online and all the information is on the website and we are going to keep putting things on Facebook every once in a while just to remind people. Um, the only other thing we really have is hopefully, like Nancy said, since volunteers can come out sometime to help, we are going to work. We have three uh, memorial benches that we got for, from three different families from their uh, donations and that happened, we got them right before COVID. And so those have never been installed. So we hope to get those done soon. And then also from a grant that Jim wrote um, through the Jasper, Jasper Community Foundation or something like that, um, it's with Jasper County. And that will be some improvements at the Oak Savannah Trailhead. Um, there will be a kiosk and a picnic table, trash containers, um, bike repair stations. So that will be nice if we can, Hopefully we're gonna have a few volunteers that will help with that to get that going. Um, but otherwise we're just kind of waiting till the visitor center opens basically, because then hopefully then we can get the nature store open again and start being there to greet all the visitors too. So, but yeah, if any of the other board members wanna add anything, feel free. Otherwise that's all I had. Thank you so much, Joan. I appreciate that yeah. update. Mark, Jim, Sharon, anything you'd like to share? Well, I might want to add one thing. I just was reading the news. Um, it came out this afternoon. The CDC is now, <clears throat> excuse me, now saying that people who have had both COVID or either the one or the two vaccinations can now go outside or indoors uh, without uh, without masks. So that may impact the Fish and Wildlife Service as far as the, when they're going to be opening the doors and that. So mm -hmm. maybe a little sooner than we think, but. It'll probably be a while yet, I would assume. So that's yeah, I I'm think we're, we're going to be doing baby steps. And I think the fact that we had volunteers at the refuge was a big step for us. So, you know, I think it's going to little by little. Yeah. Well, and that's one thing I just thought of. I was going to mention if anyone is on the call or you know of anyone who might be interested in helping once the visitor center opens up again um, to man the front, front desk and the nature store, um, it's really, I mean, the the system is really easy to use for the store and we just need as many people as we can to help out on that. And it's usually a lot of people just do half days. There's a couple people who did a full day, but, um, and we'll do training. It's not like you just immediately get put out there. We usually have you, you know, work with an experienced person for a few times. So if you're interested, just, um, you know, you can shoot us an email. Um, friends email is buffalo at tallgrass.org. Um, or you can give me a call. Um, I can put my phone number in the chat too, um, just in case anybody has any questions. So anyway, safety, thank you. And safety protocol is in place. So we have uh, uh, some plexiglass up and tables to help secure the, the six foot distance and masks are mandated indoors and hand sanitizer in the building. So once it is open, there'll definitely be a lot of safety precautions in place. So that's, to, if that helps to, if you can, are considering helping at the front desk. Any other board member updates? All right, I did forget one thing. So when we do request volunteers, 
activities, we have to write up what is called a prod. That's the, the um, acronym. I don't know what it stands for, but it has to be written by Scott, our, our refuge manager and sent up to the regional office and has to be approved by his supervisor. So anything that new that we do, we have to put that in place. And so it's a process. So we did get approved to do the planting. And also we're gonna also start opening up uh, seed cleaning. So Karen's gonna put out and uh, send me an email with a summary of what, how, to, how we're gonna go about doing that. But the seed cleaning will be uh, that the, the refuge volunteers will pick up the seed trays, take it home, clean it, and then bring it back. So that's something that you can volunteer to do but it will be at your home. And we will need to get a new volunteer service agreement from that needs to be updated annually. So if you're interested in that, there'll be an email coming out shortly about how you can help with the seed cleaning. Cause we definitely, they already started collecting seeds for this year. They said they just collected seed from pussy toes which is one of the, the earlier blooming flowers on the refuge. All right. So let's see, we are at, I think anything else anybody wants to add? Board members, Patrick? If not, we'll move on to the invasive plant in management. Everybody just loves invasive plants, I'm sure. All right, so bear with me while I have to change my screen. While you're getting that up, Nancy, I just wanna say good seeing everyone. Hopefully I can see you all in person someday soon when it's safe and have a good rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you, Patrick. Yep, good seeing y'all. All right, so bear with me. And Nancy, you might want to mention the um, burning of the prairie. Oh, yeah. Then Thank you, Sharon. I forgot all about that. We burned, I think, 550 acres on the northwest side of the refuge. So that was, that was awesome. That was done in two days. And it's amazing. In just a week, it starts greening up. And it's fun to see because you see all the ant mounds. I mean, there's just hundreds and hundreds of ant mounds that are exposed once it's, once it's, uh, once it's burned. And that's probably all we're going to be able to do this, this season with burning. So we'll have to look to the fall because usually uh, the burning is done on the refuge in the spring and the fall. That was, thank you. I forgot all about that. All right. So we're going to dive into invasive species. So here we have a wonderful picture, a beautiful prairie. And what you don't see, you don't see a lot of invasive species of uh, plants. And that's what we're striving to do at the refuge. So we have mostly reconstructed prairie and it needs to be managed. So just if you don't know the background about the, about the prairie at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, the refuge was established in 1991 and most of the acreage that was, that was purchased was former cropland or homestead. So it was actually rebuilding the prairie from the ground up. There wasn't much left. That's why it's called reconstruction rather than restoration. So when you reconstruct uh, a prairie from cropland like this cornfield or a soybean field, there's a lot of management that goes into it. You can't just plant seeds. You have to do a lot of things to help foster the growth and health of that ecosystem that's uh, new. And one of those things is, is uh, eradicating or managing invasive species. So right now at the refuge, we have approximately 6,000 acres of reconstructed tall grass prairie and, uh, uh, and uh, restored oak savanna. And one of the goals of the refuge is to make, to increase the diversity, both with plants and with wildlife. So you can see the diversity as the prairie matures, as we gain more acreage, we are getting more diversity of plants with volunteers helping us come out and plant the prairie, gather seeds. It's all creating a more diverse place. Different bird species are finding their way back. We've introduced several different species. So over time, the prairie and the ecosystem will, if we manage it properly, will continue to grow and mature and, and, and get uh, healthier over time. Bear with me, I have to just change my screen here for a second. So as I mentioned, the prairie reconstruction does not end with just seeds. So once the, the, the cropland is prepared, the seeds, there's a seed prescription that's written and then they use a tractor and a seed spreader and then it starts to grow hopefully 
And then there comes a lot of maintenance, which includes, as you see, a picture of prescribed burning. And there's a lot of different invasive plants. They're from different places, different oranges, and there's a lot of different ways to control invasive species or invasive plants. So I'm talking a lot about invasive species. So what is an invasive species? So basically it's an, an, an organism, it could be a plant or an animal that causes ecological or economic harm in a new environment where it's not native. So it's brought in from someplace else out of its range. It could be from a di different part of the country. It could be from across uh, the world, but they're brought in and typically when they're uh, animal or plants introduced into a new area, they don't have anything to stop it from spreading. There's no natural predators or no, nothing to inhibit it. So that causes a major problem because it will outcompete out uh, our native plants or if it's an animal, it can cause a lot of damage in, in a lot of different ways. So invasive plants are non-native and they're very aggressive. They grow very quickly and they crowd out other species. And what this can do is it decreases plant diversity. It decreases wildlife habitat. It also, these uh, in non-native invasive plants serve little function for wildlife. However, not all non-native plants are invasive. So invasive means if they're non-native and invasive, that means they're taking over very aggressive. So categories of invasive species, does anybody know what this plant, the picture of this plant is? If you do, you can pop it, in, pop it in the chat. Let me know if uh, anybody answers, Joan, if you will. You'll probably see it in growing in some people's uh, in yards. Does anybody know what it is? Well, we'll we'll, let, we'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it. So there's high threat species, and those are species that you can actually you have a good chance of maintaining. So that would be an example would be Sericea lespediza. It could be uh, black locust or autumn olive. So these are species that there's a, a really high chance of being able to maintain them. So we do a lot of effort in trying to, to manage those species so they don't get out of control. Then you have persistent threat species. And that would be something like sweet clover, both white and yellow sweet clover, where we're probably no matter what we do, we're never going to be able to get rid of them because it's just such an aggressive and steadfast uh, species of plants is very difficult. So white and uh, yellow sweet clover are one of those plants that are probably are going to be with us forever, but we can manage it to minimize their impact. That's the good news. The potential threats are those species that are in the surrounding area that are have a likely chance to be transferred to the refuge. Some examples could be our garlic mustard, uh, buckthorn. So those are not at the refuge yet, but since they're right outside the borders of the refuge, there's a good chance they may get onto our land. So we have to keep a check out and look out for those. And then there's the low threat species. These are species that really don't harm the prairie. They're not capable of overtaking the prairie. They're more uh, nuisance or noxious weeds. That would include include uh, wild parsnip. And these plants are, are difficult, or Queen's Anne's lace. The uh, matured prairie, they just can't compete with the mature prairie. But the problem is if they're growing on the refuge, they can, they're a public, uh, they're a nuisance to the public and farming community because they can spread from our land to theirs. So that's not something that we don't wanna have on the refuge property. Aha, somebody got the answer, Robert. Yep, that is yep. it. So, yep. uh, yep. And Jim Coombe did grass. too. Yep, plume yep. grass. And Jim and, got it. Yeah, and uh, silver plume grass. And this one's very difficult to eradicate. So you'll see it in patches. And it's unfortunate um, and that it is on the refuge, but we try to manage it. Thank you for answering. Yeah, and so, we, had uh, a, go oh, ahead. We, had a, we had a question about what are dandelions? Are you know, those considered I, I, invasive? Would they be? Well, I would, you know, I don't know for sure. I would have to ask Karen, but from my, just from my minimal knowledge, I would probably put those in uh, uh, maybe a noxious weed because they're not really damaging uh, the, the prairie, but they are spreading, but I would have to double check. Good question. They do provide food for, for bumblebees 
and other bees. So that's a, a positive point, but I'll double check with Karen and see which category she would put those in. Good question, Sharon. Thank you for sharing. And please feel free to put, uh, please put free to put any questions in the chat. Sorry, my, oh, there we go. So how do we get rid of invasive species? There's a lot of different ways we can do that. And you'll see some pictures here. Actually, you'll see, uh, we do some tree removal. We'll actually pull uh, weeds and, and invasives by hand. We'll mow things that are forming big mats. You can see the tractor at the bottom there. That's uh, probably, mowing big mats of white and, uh, sweet, uh, white and yellow sweet clover. In the top right, you can see some herbicide application. So some species need that. That's the only way we can really get rid of them. So, and then we keep an eye out. How do we, um, if we don't monitor the situation, get out there and see what's going on, then we, things can get out of control. So there's a lot of work to be done by our, our biology staff. And, we, and for them to be, to apply herbicides, they actually have to get a pesticides license. So a lot of work goes into removing invasive species and managing. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing my, oh, there we go, sorry. So this was a, this is a phenomenal project that I was really kind of blown away about when I learned about it. And it's called Working Dogs for Conservation. And lucky for us, our friends group, the Friends of Neil Smith, National Wildlife Refuge actually, actually have been hiring the Working Dogs for Conservation uh, for several years. The program started in 2010. And the whole idea about this is the monitoring aspect. So they used to try to have interns go out and walk the prairie and look for invasive species. And you can imagine that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So it wasn't very efficient. And so, Karen, our biologist, found out about this project with Working Dogs for Conservation. So they're hired and the dogs are actually trained to sniff out particular plants. So they have hired these dogs to sniff out the invasive plant called Cerisia lespedeza. And they can actually smell that plant from 20 to 30 meters away. And what happens is that the uh, plants are GPS. Their location is, is located by GPS. It's also flagged. And then our staff will go out and actually uh, spray herbicide on this plant because that's the best way to get rid of this plant. And it's spot spraying. So you're not spraying everything around it. You're spraying that individual plant to minimize the impact on the surrounding vegetation that you want. Additionally, they also been high, they also hired the, the dogs to to find uh, a rare plant called world milkweed. They didn't know, the biologist crew did not know how much world milkweed, which is a rare, they thought it was a rare plant on the refuge and is very important because it's a host plant for the monarch butterfly as you probably know is in decline. So they hired the dogs to find it. And what they found out, there's so much world milkweed on the refuge it's a very low, small growing plant, so it's hard to find that the dogs were inundated and they couldn't focus because they needed more space and scattered plants. So the upside to that was that we found that we had a lot of a world milkweed. The downsides was it was overwhelming for the dogs and it really wasn't a good project for them. So all in all, uh, we found out some good news about it. So a really very interesting project. We haven't been able to do it the last couple of years because of COVID, but we hope to do it in the future. So how do we prevent the spread how do, how, of uh, invasive species? Our staff takes it very, uh, very, very uh, conscientious of what they're doing. So anytime they drive in the prairie, they actually wash the vehicles, whether it's a UTV or a car. So for instance, Karen and uh, her crew will go and do bison surveys usually once a week and they drive through the bison enclosure into the prairie. So once they're done, they will go back to the uh, shop and they will spray it down, making sure they clean the tire treads. Additionally, they brush their own boots with boot brushes to remove any seeds that can be transferred. And there are some uh, seeds that are more likely to be transferred as you probably know, you've experienced 
seeds that can be attached to your clothes or your shoes, or sometimes there's things like garlic mustard that can get the seeds can get in the mud and get stuck in your, the, the treads of your shoes. So Karen actually just recently put in a request to get some boot brushes so that we can put them at trailheads and at the, uh, probably at the visitor center so that we can help stop the spread. And these are things that you can do when you're out hiking as well. It doesn't have to be at the refuge. So some of the species that are a problem at the refuge, here's a list of them. And I'm gonna go just briefly through some of these plants and a little bit about their background and how we manage them. So one of them is smooth brome, and this can be just vast uh, parcels of this on the refuge. And this was brought in as a, a graze for food for animals, for grazing animals. And it's a cool season grass. So the one way to manage it is to burn it when it's actually growing. When Meaning a cool season grass, it's, it's growing in the cooler months. So if it's burned at that point when it's starting to go into its reproductive part of its life cycle, then you can and hopefully get rid of it. But it's, it grows in these massive areas and it, it can be very difficult to eradicate. And I, as I mentioned before, you have yellow and sweet clover and they, it grows in these tremendous mats and it's probably never gonna leave the refuge, but we definitely put a lot of effort into managing it and mowing those those uh, plants, they have a two year life cycle. So we mow the second year when they start to go to seed just before they go to seed. So they don't set seed. We, uh, they, the staff goes out and mows it so that it kills the plant and that plant won't be able to reproduce and then hopefully uh, reduce or minimize the number of, of, uh, of the plants that are, can spread on the refuge. And this plant was brought over for forage for grazing animals, as well as for making honey. So it's known, it's in the clover family. So it's a good uh, plant for making honey, which is still uh, actually used, it's still used for that today. Another plant that grows in big swaths, big mats is canary reed grass. This plant actually, grows in wet areas. There's a section if you're, when you're walking on the Oak Savannah Trail, when you're first starting, if you go in the east entrance and to the north, there's a low point and that is just filled with reed canary grass. And that is a low wet area just adjacent to Walnut Creek. And once again, it's very difficult to get rid of. It is, it grows in these huge swaths and, and mats and it actually hybridizes with another a native plant, making it very difficult and a very aggressive plant. So it's one of those plants that uh, is, is hard to eradicate from the refuge. Another one is we do have some native clovers, but this is a clover that, I'm, I'm sorry, a thistle that is not native, and this is Canada thistle. It was brought over from, from uh, Asia and it was brought in in seed crop by accident and then it has spread. So you, there are several native plant, native thistles on the refuge and this is one of the non-natives that uh, we try to manage for. And this is one that a lot of time is spent. This is a Cerecia les lespediza and this is the one that the working dogs for cons conservation uh, work a lot on. So they will go out and they will target these plants. As I mentioned, they will, the, the handler of the dogs will GPS the location and flag it. And then our staff, as you see on the screen, will go out with a UTV and with herbicide and then spray those individual plants. And that is all tracked in a, in a GPS system and, and data uh, system. And the one we looked at before is a silver plume grass. And this is another one very difficult to eradicate. Herbicide has to be applied several times to get rid of it. And then we have uh, black locust. Uh, you probably have seen this plant. This is the one that gets those really thick thorns. And this is a plant that is from the Ozark, Ozarks in Appalachia, and it was brought into the Midwest. And this plant is, we can get rid of it by cutting it down, or we could also girdle it. You can see the picture on the left. We have a, one of our volunteers is uses a draw knife and girdles the out, outside of the, a ring around the tr tr tree trunk, sorry. And it kills the growing layer uh, that provides a food for the plant or for the tree and kills it off. So you'll actually see some of that in the oak savanna. You'll see some girdle trees so that we're getting rid of the, plant, the trees that we don't 
uh, need that we don't want to have in the oak savanna. So this is a, another plant um, is actually benefits from fire. So if you burn it, it will actually re-sprout and it grows in a colony. So the best method of getting rid of it is cutting it or girdling it. So that is a very fast and quick summary of uh, invasive species and its management on the refuge. And this is a lovely photo that Rick Hager, who was uh, used to work for the refuge and worked very hard on eradicating invasive species on the refuge. He did a lot of hard work to do, uh, to do that. And this is his, one of his pictures he shared with me. And he loved this picture because there's very little invasive species in this photo. Mm -hmm. And of course you got a bison in it. So how could you not <laughs> like it? So, so yeah, so I think this is a very special picture because a lot of hard work went into providing a prairie with very limited invasive species. So <clears throat> anyway, thank you so much for uh, listening. I really appreciate your time. Does anybody have any questions yeah, or there anything was, they'd like to share? It's Some Bob questions. Bernard, I've got two questions. Uh, one is, what's your, what's uh, refuge budget for in handling invasive species and the gross money for that, that how much, what percentage that is your, of your whole operating budget? <laughs> That is an excellent question, Bob, and I don't know the answer. I would have to ask uh, our refuge manager, but I can find that out. I think that's a worthwhile, but it takes a lot. I mean, it's a it, purchase of chemicals and the training of staff and a good portion of time is dedicated to that. And when Rick Hager, he left about two years ago, that was one of his main jobs, you know, a full-time employee going out and doing that. That was a good portion of his work. When he left, we didn't replace that. So we lost a whole person that was able, capable of doing that. So now the rest of the biology staff, which is basically one full-time staff person and uh, a seasonal uh, biotech. And, and then also we'll, we'll get interns that are, the stipend is paid through the friends of Neil Smith. They also can get certified to do the pesticide and the mowing and things like that. So you know, a lot of effort. I will check that out, Bob. I think that's a very worthwhile question to find the answer to. So I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, my sense is it takes a lot of energy and education to continually manage the stuff. I'm it pretty, is. As a, really in, uh, intrigued about the dogs of it, you know, what their, their success that's rate point. is. That's great. That's yeah, the point I, mean, I was going to bring up, too, about the dogs. Uh, they, we've had the dogs on the refuge now, what, seven, eight years, I suppose. I think there was a study done several years ago about how efficient the dogs were compared to people. And if I, I don't remember the exact, exact number, but it's like 20 to 30 times more efficient that a dog can be than the human as far as identifying the invasive species. And I think uh, we were, I think we were paying the, the handlers about, was it Joan, is that either 10 or $20,000 a year for the dog? I, think, she it, was 20, I think it was like 10. Months, yeah. Yeah, it was a it's just a phenomenal yeah. return. So it is, it is a major portion of the budget. Very Thank worthwhile you. because you're putting all the work into, you know, purchasing seeds, collecting seeds, doing all the work to get that prairie reconstructed, and then you have to manage it. And if you don't manage it, it's gonna, it's not gonna be what we want it to be. And those invasive species, especially in a new prairie, are gonna uh, take over. So very important. There were a couple questions in the chat. Um, it asked our, whoops, it moved on me. <laughs> <laughs> Too many out there. Let's see. Love the questions. Oh, Thank you so much for com was, them coming does Queen, in. Does Queen Anne's lace have any redeeming value for prairie? It's pretty. <laughs> 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 you know, very good question. Who asked that question? Um, I think it was Robert. Is that it? No, let me think. Yeah, it's okay. Robert. Not not Bob, but Robert. <laughs> Robert, thank you. Good question. Uh, you know, it does provide, I, I do see insects on it. And it is one of those species that is, uh, it's a, a low threat. It's not going to overtake the prairie. So it's not one that we really manage for. A very healthy prairie as it matures will get rid of the Queen's Anne's lace. So it's uh, aesthetically it's pretty and it does. I, I have seen insects on it, so it must provide some some resource for insects, whether it's pollen or nectar. I'm not quite sure. 
And there may be other benefits that I'm not aware of. And then uh, Sharon had a question. I think Jim answered that. She asked if there are some native Lespedeses and Jim mentioned bush clover as one of those. Yes, yep. And the one that the Cerecia lespedeza, that one is uh, originally from China that was introduced and it was brought in on purpose and, and spread. So a lot of these plants have made it to our area because they were an intentionally, intentionally introduced people not knowing the consequences of what they were doing. In the, in the long and then two other questions. Um, at one time, Jim was asking, at one time volunteers were going out with GPS units to mark non-native invasives. Each volunteer had a section. Is this still in practice or will it be? You know, that's a good question. I That is something if people are interested in doing, that could be something that uh, I can approach Karen about and see if that uh, would be something that they that volunteers can work with the biological staff. So I don't know, you know, because of COVID and not marking the plants with the working dogs, if that's uh, feasible. The other thing is if you do, you want to get your pesticide license, you can do that. And I believe the refuge can pay for that, but it is studying and taking a test. And, and if that's something that you want to do, you can speak to me about it and we can provide the, the, the payment for the uh, pesticide license. And um, I don't know if there's special clothing, but it's uh, really valuable uh, if somebody's interested in helping with that, because you can see there's a lot of work to be done and not a lot of staff to do it. So if you're interested in any of that invasive species management, either hand pulling, uh, we, we could use help with that, as well as the spraying if you wanna get certified. And then we can find out if the GPS marking is, is still something that the biological team can use help with. Good questions. Yeah. I really love the questions, thank you. Yeah. Then there was a two part question. Are there different invasive species in the bison enclosure? And can mammals eating an invasive, invasive species be used to control it? Uh, excellent question. And there's a lot of invasive species in the bison enclosure, probably a good majority of what we went over today. And I, I if anybody else knows about this, please chime in because I am, I am not sure of if the bison can help control the invasive species. I would have to check that out. Does anybody have any knowledge on that that they can share? No, Another I, excellent question. I don't, but I always wonder, do they don't, does, do none, like the bison, the deer, the elk, do none of them eat the sweet clover? Well, the, the thing is with the sweet clover, that's what I was thinking, that they could help manage that, but they have to eat it before it goes to seed oh, okay. in its second growing year. So I don't know if that they would be as efficient or, or even if they like it. Uh, bison typically like grass. That's their preference is grasses rather than flowering plants. You know, not that grasses aren't flowering plants, but wildflowers. And so a white and, and yellow sweet clover are actually wildflowers rather than uh, mm -hmm. grasses. Grass is flower, but they don't get the wildflower um, as as uh, the wildflowers do, the flowers mm -hmm. that we see so visibly. So another good question that um, I just don't know the answer. So I got some homework to do to get back <laughs> with you and, and learn for myself. So just goes to show you how much it's, how important it is for uh, you're watching these, uh, coming to these meetings and participating and and learning and then helping me to learn more so and know what needs to be found out. So thank you so much for all the wonderful questions. I'm really enjoying them. Any other questions that you can think of or any comments, anything you'd like to share? I, you know, I, uh, Joan, I just found how I can look at the chat. So I just saw a, a entry by Robert says deer will like deer will like the Forbes Forbes or wildflowers another term for wildflowers more than the grass okay so I'm going to find out because I think that's a really interesting uh question about if uh the wildlife can help manage those invasives as well as how much is the budget are uh, we spending on invasive species management really did I leave out any other questions those are the two that I remember yeah, Nancy, one one comment about the when you about the bison eating the uh, the clovers. 
Check too if uh, bison are subject to bloating because of eating clover. A lot of times cattle get in clover and they bloat. Mm -hmm. And I know some, I can't think of the ones offhand, but I think uh, water, uh, water hemlock, is it? Or some of these plants could be poisonous to, uh, yeah. you know, cattle and wildlife. So I, I can't think of the, the ones that are. I'm just writing this down in my notes so I can follow <laughs> up with uh, those excellent questions so I can get some answers on that. So any other thoughts on invasive species management, or we can just open it up now to just, you know, any questions, anything you'd like to share with the group? Anybody been out to the refuge lately? Just anything? me, <laughs> I have been. <laughs> It's kind of curious. Uh, I have kind of. I used to work, do a lot of work at Living History Farms, and what the area when Iowa was settled from between eight, about eighteen, let's say eighteen forty to eighteen sixty, most of the immigrants that came to Iowa came from other parts of the U.S., you know, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Ohio, that sort of thing. They knew about Iowa, so they they uh, they, they knew there's good land here. The so they'd come here, they'd buy. Like 160 acres was a typical purchase. They bought it from the government for $1.25 an acre. Now, the Mormons came from Nauvoo to Council Bluffs in the late 1840s. And there's many diaries of about going across Iowa. And the tall grass prairie became prominent because in many of the diaries, the, the men would say the only people that could see over the top of the grass were the men riding on the horses. The tall grass was that tall. And... Um, so a lot of people get kind of, get kind of boring walking across the state, but the, the soils are such now that we will never be able to see the tall grass prairie like it was, as it was in 18, 1830, 1840, 1850. Now by, eight, by 1900, the entire state of Iowa was turned to agriculture, and that was done with horses. Most of these farmers would buy the 160 acres, and then they'd start, they'd, they'd, the first year they try to plow 20 acres and raise a crop for, and have livestock. Each year after that, they try to add one more acre of plowed ground into their farm. After about 20 years, if the farmers realized they could not handle 160 acres, so they started selling it off. So that's how Iowa became an, an agricultural state. It was just one acre at a time. So a lot of hard work with horses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you see, Na oh, we lost Nancy again. Um which also, I forgot, I introduced some of the board members, also Amanda Yancey. I forgot she's on the board too. So she's on the phone. So hi, Amanda and PJ. Um, the question was about, do you have any antelope? No, there's really, there's no antelope um, out there. It's just the elk and the bison and the deer. So. Um, the brown squirrels. Yeah. Brown squirrels. And they, you know, at one time they had talked about getting, you know, because if you see, there's a lot of places that have goats to main, you know, to, <laughs> take care of invasives, but goats can tear, carry some type of a disease that can transmit to bison. And so that's why they have never wanted to try it. Even if they had them a long ways away, there was always that fear that they could infect the bison. So, because goats I think would be helpful in places, but um, just won't work out there, so. The other question we'll get, and Neil, Neil Smith brings us up all the time, prairie chickens. Yeah. The refuge is not big enough to maintain a population of prairie chickens. They'll just migrate out. So he says, we need prairie chickens there, but they just were too small. Yeah. I apologize. I lost my connection. Yeah, we lost you for a bit. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry bad, about that. But I don't know if what you guys were talking about since I was in the, the technology oblivion, but... Uh, but if you have a chance, the oak savanna is just gorgeous. Did, did, uh, were you just speaking about that, Joan? No, we weren't. But that's one thing I was going to mention. If anybody is, can come out, the woodland flocks is blooming everywhere. And the birds are migrating through. So you never know what you might see out there. So it's beautiful. I just found some jack in the pulpits, which are just so hard to find because they're green and they blend in. But they're such a, a unique plant. So it's really cool. So I hope you get a chance. And then if you get a chance, go take a walk on the Overlook Trail and you can check out that uh, 
that self-guided uh, birding skills program that we, we put together. And uh, you can try the OnSell app, you can download that. We don't, we put in, right now you have to go to the website and use it from the website that uh, Patrick put in the link. We did, we are going to get it so that it goes to the Google store and what's the other one, Google and, anyway, you'll be able to download it as an app, but we have to get approval for that. So that should be coming soon where you can actually, it'll be downloadable on your phone. So, so uh, lots of cool things, bison calves, lots of birds, Dick Sissels are back. Those are the, those birds, the uh, colorful yellow birds and brown birds that sit up high and just keep on singing and singing. So lots of cool things happening at the refuge. Otherwise, no other questions in the chat, so. Anything else anybody want to share? Any places else you've been out seeing? Anybody do any mushroom hunting? Jim, you're smiling. Did you do any mus mushroom hunting? No, it's been too dry. <laughs> yeah, geez, ain't that the truth? Welcome to Iowa. Yeah, um, right? There is just turkey. Anybody out doing turkey hunting? No. No. I don't know if you can see, there is a question in the chat, update on the eagles from Robert. Oh, well, we'll give that to you, Joan, since you know most about it. Joan is the yeah. one that found the nest, actually. Yeah, the nest, I mean, we know just from looking at it, before the trees leafed out, there was definitely young on there because you could see them, the adults feeding them. And you could see the heads come up. We thought two for sure, we didn't know about a third. But the problem is where it's at, It's it, you can't walk to it. You have to see it from a road that's a ways away. And once the trees leaf out, I can't even tell you where it's at. I drive right by it and on the road and I, so I don't know. We hope there's still eagles around all the time. So I've seen the adult ones right down the road from it um, by Basswood, the little bridge that's down from Basswood. That's where I've seen the eagles sitting in the trees there, so. I don't know. Just have to keep watching for them, I guess. So. Sounds good. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for joining us tonight and continuing to support the refuge. We couldn't do what we do without you. We really need our volunteers so desperately. You're just wonderful people, fun to work with, and just do so much for us. So we're very grateful. And the more we all get educated about this wonderful refuge, the better it is that we can be ambassadors for it. I continue to learn. When I put together these programs, I actually work with Karen who has extensive knowledge about the refuge. So as I put together these PowerPoints, I am learning and then I can better communicate with the public about the resources and what needs to be done. So it's really, I'm very grateful that you pitch in and, and are willing to learn about this wonderful place that is our refuge that we work so hard together for. So the next meeting is gonna be June 11th, and it's going to be an afternoon. So that's the Friday. We alternate between evenings and afternoons every other, you know, each month. So next month, it's going to be June 11th from three to four. So we'll have the updates again. And then we're going to have a presentation on the Oak Savannah and the management of the Oak Savannah. So uh, that's a, a wonderful place on the refuge if you haven't been to. There's also Basswood Trail, which is another Savannah area that's in the southern part of the refuge. That's a half mile trail as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you can check out those on sale, uh, the on sale wildlife drive tour and the migratory bird uh, stations on the Overlook Trail. And hopefully you can get out. If not at the refuge, get out and see some wonderful spring things happening in your neighborhood or in your backyard. And uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Thank you. And I'll give you updates on the seed cleaning and the other uh, volunteer opportunities in the near future. Be well, everybody. Be safe and be well. Thanks, everybody. Love you guys. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.